Hi everyone and welcome to module 12, Liability and Risk Management. In this class we're going to talk about some of the common terms and areas of a concern as they regard to emergency care and our responsibilities as athletic administrators and how those things are set in place. First, I want you to think about your familiarity with legal cases and risk involving athletics. We're going to go through a few definitions. First one we have is a tort. A tort is a wrongful act that results in an injury to a person or property or reputation of another person and for which that person may seek compensation through legal action. Negligence is the failure to act in a manner that would be expected of a reasonable or prudent person in a similar situation under comparable circumstances. It's an unintentional act and is not premeditated, but the action results in an injury or harm to another person. Duty or duty or obligation it's a recognized by law requiring a person to conform to a certain standard of conduct for the protection of others against unreasonable risk. Breach of duty is a failure on a person's part to conform to the required standard of conduct. And then causal connection, this is reasonably close causal connection between the conduct and the resulting injury proximate or legal cause. This class, we want to focus on liability issues and risk management strategies. And you have a decision to make. You could zone out and say, I've heard this before, or you could focus on what I'm going to talk about because while it might not be the most exciting area, it may be an area that will affect you and your programs later down the line we look at approximately one-third of the NCAA member institutions that were surveyed in a five-year period, they would say that negligence liability actions have been brought against them within a five-year time frame. Many of the authors and experts talk about the obligations that an administrator has in the areas of risk and liability. You've got to provide a safe environment. You've got to protect the organization from the threat or consequences of legal action. And then you need to provide financial protection for itself against acts of negligence. The objectives of the program, safety. And to do this, we need to start with the very basic premise, and that's safety being the responsibility of every person involved in providing programs for students, athletes, and consumers. There are two major reasons why so much emphasis is placed on safety. One, the nature of activities. It involves rapid movement, sudden and explosive starts and turns, physical exertion, the use of many different instruments for hitting objects, high velocity projectiles that are either thrown, caught, falling, body contact, and then two, the litigious society within which programs exist. Now, therefore, as each administrator and staff person, you need to think individual responsibility for personal acts of negligence. We all try to administer programs that focus primarily on the well being of our participants. It is the administrator's responsibility to conduct the program in a way that precludes legal action against staff members, administrators, owners, institutions, organizations, and businesses. And this can only be accomplished by eliminating the common basis for legal action, negligent behavior. Going back to one of our first classes, we talk about how, well, through training and supervision. Policies and procedures should include appropriate ways of administering, teaching, and supervising all areas of a program. This includes such things as 
supervision techniques, curriculum, methodology, instructional and support environment, discipline, organization, first aid, and facilities. Knowing this, then we look at the three kinds of cases. We have civil, criminal, and contract law. Civil, this is one individual versus another. Criminal, this would be the state versus the individual for violation of a criminal code. And then contract, this would be an agreement between two parties that's been violated. Tort negligence, if we go back to our definition of tort, it's a wrongful act that results in an injury to a person, property, or reputation of another person for which that person may seek compensation through legal action. The primary focus is on civil action to provide restitution for a wrong that was committed to another person. In other words, a tort is an activity or behavior that strays from what we would consider normal conduct. Intentional tort, this was where we're looking at the intent to harm versus unintentional tort, meaning there was no intent to injure, but the injury did occur. It's negligence. And as administrators, then we need to understand the principles of negligence and the defense against negligence and know how to provide programs that will not be jeopardized by negligent actions. Negligence, by definition, is the failure to act in a manner that would be expected of a reasonable, prudent person in a similar situation under comparable circumstances. It is an unintentional act and is not premeditated, but the action results in an injury or harm to another person. It refers to civil, not criminal, and the actions, and it's the basis for civil lawsuits when an injury or loss results. Theory is based on principle that those who are harmed as a result of others' carelessness or failure to carry out responsibilities properly must be compensated. To recover damages in court for actions of negligence, it depends upon the existence of four essential elements. The first one is duty. A duty or an obligation, as it's known as, is recognized by law requiring a person to conform to a certain standard of conduct for the protection of others against unreasonable risk. It must be shown that the individual, meaning the defendant, had the duty to the person, or the plaintiff, who was injured. It implies that a special relationship exists between the injured person and the alleged wrongdoer. A duty to not expose the person to unreasonable risk or injury. The second, a breach of duty. This is a failure on a person's part to conform to the required standard of conduct. The defendant must be shown to have used unreasonable conduct in carrying out responsibility to the injured person. Think about this question. Is the act to protect in accord with the standard of care a professional should give to the person with whom there is a special relationship? Third is causal connection. With causal connection, a reasonably close causal connection between the conduct and the resulting injury. It's proximate or a legal cause. It must be shown that the breach of duty actually caused the injury. There must be a direct relationship between the action or inaction of the defendant and the injury that occurred. And then the fourth damage issue. There needs to be an actual loss or damage, a legally recognizable injury. It must be shown that an actual loss, harm, or injury did occur. All four of these elements of negligence must be present for a plaintiff to recover damages. There are defenses against negligence. Negligence not proven, if it can be found that the defendant did not have a duty to the plaintiff, this is their best offense. Assumption of risk, based on the theory that no harm done to one who consents, 
the assumption that the plaintiff is aware of the inherent danger in a given situation and willingly accepts those risks. Contributory negligence. This refers to a situations in which the plaintiff in some way contributed to their own harm. Any negligence on the part of the plaintiff bars this person from recovering any damages. Comparative negligence where an assessment is made of the varying degrees of negligence on the part of the defendant and the plaintiff, and settlement is given accordingly. The jury determines the percentage of the contributing fault. And then governmental immunity. It prevents legal action for damages against the government and its political subdivisions. The best way to stay out of court to provide programs which are not threatened by negligent acts is to be proactive about creating safe environments where your employees understand risks and how to manage the inherent dangers of the activity. As administrators, risk management, we have to ensure that the best possible safety procedures are incorporated into the instruction, supervision, and operation of our programs. The first steps Identify risks in present program. Second, estimate the extent of those risks. And then third, assess the approaches that can be taken to reduce risk. And then our final step, implement risk reduction procedures and policies. How does an athletic administrator create an environment where negligence is reduced? Well, let's start off with the first one, supervision. Legal scholars tell us that 80% of all court cases involving alleged negligence for sport injury deal with some aspect of supervision. First of all, the supervisor must be qualified to supervise. Are there certifications such as CPR or first aid that are required? Well, they must have those. Supervision must know emergency procedures to be followed in case an accident occurs you must have some active supervision in each area or situation, and you must monitor the activity of the participants, enforce the rules, and then see that the safe environment is maintained. Supervisors cannot absent themselves. The vantage point must allow you to see entire area from a single vantage point, and then supervisors need to inform participants through signage or verbal communication. Instruction, select activities that are appropriate for the age group. Teaching progressions and make sure that they are followed. Have a lesson plan. Provide necessary protective equipment and never force a student to perform a skill. With facilities, grounds, and equipment, make sure the equipment has come under close scrutiny by the courts. Buy safe equipment and only use it for what it's designed for. Inspect areas consistently and be prepared to cancel an activity if the area is unsafe. And then secure equipment and facility areas when not in use. Our fourth, first aid and emergency medical assistance. Teach coaches and staff how to administer first aid. Have a written plan for handling emergencies. Certify all the personnel in first aid. And then when an injury occurs, fill out an injury or incident report form. And then our last one is the transportation of students. Only school transportation should be used. There shouldn't be any private cars. And then if they choose to go home with moms or dads, there should be a form that's filled out releasing consented release. So practical applications. What can you do as a coach and sports administrator to reduce risk in your sport programs? Well, develop, curriculate, and educate about your emergency action plan. Designate a staff officer to conduct and assume responsibility for the safety audit of the sport program, and then develop a clear written policy for identifying and correcting potential risks. Correct or eliminate potential risks before allowing the program or activity to begin or continue. Check 
on your liability insurance? Is there enough to protect the participants or personnel? Our fifth, know and obey the rules and regulations and the law as they apply to your area. Warn participants in the program of all potential dangers and risks. Provide competent personnel to direct and supervise the SCORE program. Consider age of participants, the degree of difficulty of a skill, and things along those lines in determining the number of supervisors and the activity. Consult with a qualified attorney in planning the operation of the safety audit and the overall program. And then keep aware and abreast of any current trends and attend seminars and workshops. Now that we've gone through all of this, I want you to see how this is all played out in a practical application. At the top of our video presentation is the Canvas link to the Gettysburg College case from Jim to Jury. And read through that and follow along with where this case kept going back and forth until it got to the Supreme Court. That's all we have for this module. I'll talk to you on the next.